So with the endodontic diagnostic terms as per the AA, uh, you must include a palpal and periapical uh, diagnostic like, terms uh, for that particular tooth. So I got some uh, clinical case scenarios to go through, uh, which would help you to just practice uh, some of these diagnostic terms. The first case, um, yeah, it's a 53-year-old uh, lady who came to see me complaining of uh, spontaneous pain on the uh, upper right quadrant. So uh, this was keeping her awake at night. Uh, she could not uh, locate the, which was the, which the causative tooth. And uh, um, the clinical tests, uh, you can see that on the in, in, in the table here and also the radiograph which I took. So uh, they, there are other clinical tests which I done, including pedonal pocketing, palpation tests, all those were with the normal limits, so I haven't actually put them on. So this actually gives you what you need to come to your pulpal and periapical diagnosis for, the, uh, for whichever tooth it is. So if you look through the case uh, here, um, the radiographically, there's no obvious epical pathology, but I think probably you'll have to uh, look into the clinical uh, tests here. So the upper right six was negative uh, to the thermal test, while the upper right five and four were positive. And upper right six was tended to percussion as well, while the others were negative. So even though looking at the radiograph, possibly the obvious one, uh, the obvious, the only obvious thing you could see is a possibly distal caries on the upper right five. Um, the other clinical tests uh, pointed towards the upper right six. So it was um, a definitive diagnosis on the upper right six because it was not responding to the cold test. So uh, let's talk about, so if you can think about what it, it could be the pulpal diagnosis is. So here the pulpal diagnosis would be because it's responding negative. Um, would be pulp necrosis uh, because it's not responding it's non-vital and periapical diagnosis would be symptomatic epical periodontitis mainly because it was symptomatic that is that there was tendinitis to percussion uh, when you're clinically examining uh, this particular tooth but at the same time and this tooth if it had um uh, it doesn't make a difference if it had an epical pathology, which was obvious on the upper right six as well. Probably it would have been easier by looking at the radiograph, uh, but without the clinical symptoms, you still would not be able to uh, come to a definitive diagnosis. So the second uh, case scenario uh, is, uh, yeah, you've seen this intraoral picture before uh, for the chronic epical abscess. So probably you've got the epical diagnosis already uh, looking at the buccal sinus. And so this patient uh, was referred in for routine treatment of the lower left six and lower left seven. Uh, there was uh, buccal sinus associated with the lower left six and seven. So the patient had occasional pain uh, uh, on the lower left quadrant and the dentist noticed the buccal sinuses and referred in. So a GP tracer was used um, to locate uh, where uh, this was coming through, the buccal sinus is um, uh, coming from. So uh, it points to the lower left six and the seven as well, both the distal roots. So the clinical findings here again, uh, the lower, yeah. so uh, you, you definitely need to check the nearby uh, teeth and contralateral as well. So here uh, you can see that there was a lower left five as well, which was checked, uh, which responded uh, with the normal limits. The lower left six and seven were negative to the cold test and they were tended to percussion as well. So it is symptomatic, but at the same time, it's got a, a chronic uh, buccal sinus on the side as well. So the pulpal diagnosis will be pulp necrosis and uh, the periapical diagnosis will be chronic epical abscess. So doctor, for the tooth, uh, I can see that on the molar, there's like a crown on it. So yeah. our sen sensitivity test can still work with a crown. On. Yes, that, that, that's the reason, another reason for endofrost as well. Uh -huh. So it can actually, it's minus 50 uh, uh, degrees centigrade. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of like it can, yeah, you can go through uh, possible border crown. crowns. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. yeah, through crowns, definitely. This patient uh, came in complaining of a fractured tooth on the upper right quadrant, uh, um, complaining of pain. And on clinical examination, uh, I could see it was uh, not a fractured tooth. It was a, a fractured filling, which was loose uh, in the tooth. Um, and uh, patient's history, uh, it, it, uh, she explains that it was keeping her awake at night and she was taking painkillers. 
and very sensitive to hot and cold drinks as well. And um, as per her explanation, it was lasting for hours um, uh, once the pain starts. So this was a radiograph uh, which was taken. Um, and uh, the upper right five, you can see the uh, filling is loose and quite probably secondary care is there as well. Uh, possibly involving, involving the pulp. So uh, clinical test wise, upper I5 uh, responded hypersensitive to endofrost. Uh, the three and four were normal. So I started with the three and the four and um, they were positive, but uh, upper I5 was hypersensitive and I had to give LA to relieve the pain because the patient was in severe pain. So, uh, and the that, that sort of like give you the pulpal diagnosis so which is um the irreversible pulpitis and again uh, with the percussion test the upper i5 was positive uh, while the upper i3 and 4 were negative um, so the periapical diagnosis uh, is symptomatic apical periodontitis because of the uh, symptoms because very apical uh, tissues have been um, involved as well in here. So the last one, um, uh, this is a case um, which was uh, referred for a retreatment of the upper right seven. Um, so the patient's uh, complaint uh, was that there was a boil next to the tube. So this again, give you an idea towards uh, what the periapical diagnosis will be like uh, a buccal sinus. So the patient presented with the buccal sinus. The patient never felt right after the root canal treatment uh, of the upper right seven a year ago. So looking at the radiograph, uh, you can see that the, uh, the, the GP tracer through the buccal sinus uh, on this radiograph points to the mesial buccal root. So it is from a, a, a well done root filling, um, but because it's pointing to the mesial buccal root, you would suspect mm, possibly a MB root, uh, a MB2 uh, there, um, and or corona leakage. So you know these are the things which will come to your mind um, of, of the etiology. So coming to the diagnosis again, um, so uh, here the tooth is previously treated. So the pulpal diagnosis will be previously treated upper right seven and periapical diagnosis would be chronic, chronic epicolapses. So this was an interesting case. Uh, when I went in, I'll show you what I saw under the microscope. So there was a, a fracture uh, through the pulp chamber floor. So this was uh, one of the reasons why uh, the, that root filling didn't work in the first place even though it was done really well. Okay, that's all it is. Thank you very much. Thanks for your time. Doctor, thank you for your sharing. I uh, just have a few questions to ask. This case shows vertical root fracture, uh, Doctor. So is that like what kind of treatment is done for this case? Or is it like yeah. just extraction? Extraction, that's uh, because especially because it is going down through the pulp chamber floor. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's not much you can do you know bacteria is going to go back at it you know whatever you do so yeah. there's no point in keeping it so yeah this tooth was taken uh, was advised to be taken out mm -hmm. all right okay doctor. yeah so after reaching this stage i i sort of abandoned the abandoned the treatment and then asked the patient to um you know temporized it and asked her to go back to her dentist to have it removed mm -hmm. okay. but it's good for the patients to see this uh, otherwise they wouldn't know you know if you see a crack and if you don't have anything to show them and they wouldn't know what you see. So mm -hmm. I, I always feel like for intraoral photographs are a great way of like showing patients and what you see. To show the patient. Yeah, evidence for what you've done. Yeah, and, and also what you've seen. Yes, yes. How do we differentiate between uh, an endo-related pain and other odontogenic pain, for example, like uh, periodontal-related pain? So uh, this is, again, as we uh, went through uh, the lecture, it is mainly uh, through the clinical um, tests uh, and also radiographic findings along with the history taking and you know everything. So we, you can't, uh, again, have a, a diagnosis from a single piece of information. So uh, it is uh, with the clinical tests, pulp tests, periodontal tests. So with the periodontal related pain, for example, um, you wouldn't have the pulp test, uh, you would find that they are within normal limits. So, and that sort of like rules out uh, the pulpal diagnosis bit. So then you concentrate on your periodontal diagnosis. And again, the patient's history will be telling you a lot of things. Sometimes, you know, it may not be totally related uh, to, uh, 
dentally related at all. So it could be trigeminal neuralgia kind of symptoms. So that might be sharp shooting pain, you know, watering of eyes and, you know, all these things, all these come from the patient's history taking. So that's the reason why or each and every single step uh, doing it systematically uh, brings you towards it. So, and it, it is so, it's a very valid question as well, that it is so important that you need to differentiate between um, um, a dentally related pain and, and a non-dentally -dental, related pain, because you don't want the patient to be having the same pain after you treated the tooth. So that is obviously, that's the wrong diagnosis again. So um, uh, yeah, it is, uh, for example, there's a, I had a patient who had been referred in uh, for a root, root canal treatment of uh, um, upper left six tooth where the tooth is, was root filled by the dentist because the patient had sharp pain um, and cold sensation, severe sensitivity to cold. So um, upper I6 was root filled and the patient continued to have the same pain. And so I examined the patient. So this patient was referred to me for the retreatment uh, because um, the, there was a suspected MB2 that was in the referral letter. You know, possibly it wasn't helping to um, um, sort the problem for the patient. So after the, the history taking itself, the patient was saying the uh, patient couldn't bite on that side. It was sharp pain when, she, when the patient was biting on the side and uh, severe sensitivity to cold. Um, but it wasn't keeping the patient awake at night or anything of that sort. So I had I went through all the uh, clinical pulp tests and, um, and so the final finding was that the upper right seven had a cracked tooth on it. Oh. So uh, since, I mean, I don't have any x-rays to show you, but uh, by having a cuspal coverage on that upper right seven, the problem was sorted. So unfortunately, the upper right six was root filled for no reason. Uh, yes, doctor. So, which means we yeah. really have to be thorough with our history yes, and know that's how to right. negotiate between of uh, course. different pain. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, doctor. Since uh, you were mentioning about cracked tooth, uh, can you like maybe uh, elaborate uh, or maybe just explain to us and uh, like how cracked tooth it appears and like what should we be looking for? So, uh, cracked tooth uh, uh, always will have the patient will be coming. I mean, uh, as dentists, when we practice, we know that you usually, you know, it is something which you see maybe day in, day out. A uh, patient will be coming to you uh, with complaining of uh, sharp shooting pain when, you, when they are biting together. They always say that I can't bite on that side. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, with the cracked tooth syndrome, um, again, uh, the main uh, thing is going through all the history taking, uh, pulp tests. Uh, I usually um, go with my uh, cold test first. Um, and if I get a reliable um, um, response from the patient uh, saying that, you know, it is responding or so this is how we teach the students as well. We ask the students to record um, each tooth with a number uh, or for the response. So say uh, if you start for, if you're looking at the lower left quadrant from lower left five, uh, or you suspect the lower left quadrant. So you sort of like start checking lower left four onwards uh, to the left side. So uh, you ask the patient uh, with the uh, cold test on the lower left four, saying that zero being no cold sensation at all and 10 being the most severe cold. So you sort of like explain to the patient, you're not expecting pain. Sometimes patients would say, I can't feel anything, mainly thinking that it is the pain they are expecting. So they, they, they'll say, I can't feel it because they're not, they're expecting pain and they just feel the cold so it's sort of like explaining to the patient before you start the process and also asking them to give you a number like zero to ten so they'll say oh that's five well sometimes they say eight and uh, they and then you take it off and ask them is it still there is it gone or, or so then you sort of like no is it like taken coming up coming away when the stimulus has been removed so all these are done systematically and you record in the in the patient's notes as well so the nurse will be recording it as the patient is saying so the dentist shouts out um, which tooth has been examined. So in such a way, many of the time you find that cracked tooth will have a hypersensitive response. Sometimes it doesn't have to be, uh, but the main finding is uh, with the tooth sleuth um, uh, or the, so where you make the patient bite onto the tooth sleuth mm -hmm. and on release of uh, the bite, you, the patient will get that sharp shooting pain, which lasts only for seconds, but it is actually sharp. Um, and you could do that uh, on each cusp of that particular tooth as well. So you know which cusp has got the fracture. So uh, that sort of like help you to, when you're going in to explore uh, the crack and remove the filling, uh, you sort of like will be able to know which cusp you need to reduce more for the cuspal coverage restoration you know, to, to provide protection for that tooth. Uh, doctor, what about yeah, internal resorption? 
Um, the finding for internal resorption is mainly from radiological finding, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and it's the ballooning uh, of the root canal space. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the same way as, as we talk about systematically uh, assessing the clinical tests and uh, the history taking, it is very important that we systematically study the radiograph as well. So when you are assessing a tooth, you sort of like look at the angulation of the tooth and you're going for a root canal treatment, you look at the root canal, you know, whether is it uh, uh, visible, reduced in size, is the pulp, pulp chamber shrunk? So then you'll have difficulty in locating the canal and probably you'll measure to the where the pulp chamber uh, is shrunk, shrunk to. So you know that you're not uh, exploring any further than that. Uh, so to make a perforation, if, if you cannot see where you're looking for. And when you look at the root canal, then again, look at the uh, morphology of it. So if it is ballooning, if it's getting enlarged in between, then that's a sign of internal resorption. Mm -hmm. Okay, so another question is how do we avoid uh, like a false positive or false negative response while taking the pump sensitivity test? So um, again, this is by being systematic uh, during the process. Uh, I, I think it will help you if you ask the patient to get a um, give you a number. So it is hard, it's because it's mainly subjective. The pulp test is how the patient is um, um, going to feel it and then how they're going to give you. So sometimes they say, oh, I can't feel it or I can maybe a little. So you need to have, you need to make it understandable to yourself. So that's the reason why uh, we always go for a number. So you sort of like if, know that when the patient says little or uh, maybe not, is it zero or one and then to a five, you know? So if the patient can, so I, I think if you try and do that uh, numbering system, it sort of help you uh, to see uh, if, you know, you you understand you understand what exactly the patient is trying to tell you, mm -hmm. and um, again, one single test wouldn't give you the answer. So if you think that the patient say it's inconclusive that the patient's saying, oh, I, I don't think I can actually feel anything. It's zero on all the teeth. Then I'll take my next test. So if the cold test is done, then I'll go for my uh, electric pulp tester, and if that's still giving me the same, then I'll go for my heat test as well. So you know, I wouldn't uh, simply rely on one clinical test. So I probably need at least two to convince me that. That, you know, yeah, maybe I'm going in the right direction. You know, so on that note, uh, like, is there like a specific test that is more reliable? I would, uh, my first go is cold test and especially endofrost. Mm -hmm. uh, it's mainly because endofrost has a, a lower um, temperature, like minus 50 degree uh, Celsius compared to uh, ethyl chloride. Mm -hmm. So uh, my first to first go um uh, pulp test uh, is uh, the cold test because it's easily available it's uh, uh, and then and it's not that uncomfortable for the patient as well mm -hmm. so uh, and then I go for my electric pulp tester so there's no one reliable you can't just call one reliable unless otherwise I, I get two uh, simultaneous uh, tests mm -hmm. uh, to be telling me the same thing yeah, I wouldn't still important. rely on any yeah. of them yeah. yeah yeah and also I should see some clinical finding I should see radiographic finding mm -hmm. and it should match with the history of the patient mm -hmm. so um, uh, so everything need to match up like a puzzle like if it yeah. doesn't match up it does it doesn't work yes 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 Again, with the percussion test as well, uh, uh, I would probably go with my finger test first because I don't want to be like tapping on a tooth, which is overtly sensitive and uh, or painful for the patient. So I probably go with my finger on on uh, on that quadrant, check uh, which tooth is more painful. So if it's the tooth, if, if I'm touching a tooth and the patient is jumping and I wouldn't be uh, taking my <laughs> mirror to tap on that tooth. So, you know, so all these things would, will help you uh, in the process and probably you will be cautious uh, when you're going to mm -hmm. tap on a tooth if, if the patient, if it is a very painful tooth. Okay, doctor, what about like uh, blowing cold air? Does that work? Uh, for me, it doesn't mainly because it, it 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 goes to it's not just going on one tooth; it's just going on you know so many teeth. Uh, so uh, I, that's not in my uh, uh, in my diagnostic tests. <laughs> I don't, I don't include that in my tests at all. Thank you, doctor, for your time with us today and for your knowledgeable input. We hope this sharing will be beneficial to everyone watching. See you all in the next episode of Bite Size Learning with MDSA. Subscribe to our channel and tune in for more videos. Comment down below what other clinical topics we should cover next. Thank you.